Hi, I'm Rick Sellens, and in this video I'd like to show you how to use fast Fourier transforms to extract frequency information from your time series signals, frequency information that isn't always easily visible when you look at the uh, raw time series data. We'll declare some constants and set aside some space to do the calculations on our data. Note that most fast Fourier transform algorithms require you to have uh, a number of data points that's a power of two, like 64, 128, 256, 512, and so on, on up. In this comparison, we're going to take an, a, a standard floating point algorithm originally from the book Numerical Recipes in C and compare its performance with a, uh, an integer FFT algorithm developed specifically by ARM for the SAMD M0 processor. The Adafruit Zero FFT uh, library provides the integer version and in the tabs attached to this sketch you'll find the floating point algorithms. We have the usual stuff in the setup function. Then in the loop function, we're going to define three different frequencies and generate a compound signal from those frequencies. This algorithm is a throwback to Fortran days when arrays started at index number one and went up from there. So we're going to skip index zero, and then we're going to put real components in elements one, three, five, etc. And the imaginary components go in two, four, six for doing FFTs on complex signals. We have just a real signal, so all of our imaginary values are going to be zero. At line 28, our signal is going to start off with zero as a mean. And then in line 29, we're going to add uh, one frequency of sine wave. Line 30, another frequency of a cosine wave at a smaller amplitude. And finally, line 31, another frequency of a sine wave at an even smaller amplitude. We'll see what that looks like when we plot the data. At line 34, we're going to put the same data into the integer array, and we're going to increase its amplitude considerably so that we can scale up and actually do the integer FFT. It's important to note that these are 16-bit integers. That means it takes up less storage space and the calculations go faster. Then at lines 36 to 43, we're going to print out the time and the floating point value of the signal and the integer value of the corresponding signal, and they should look alike. For now, I'm going to comment out the rest of the code so that we can just have a look at the uh, signal on the plotter. We can see the primary frequency is the main feature of the waveform, the up and down. But also, going a little more slowly in time, is that smaller frequency oscillating up and down, and also an even smaller frequency at a faster uh, oscillation rate. The red floating point signal and the green integer signal are different only by a scale factor. They have the same shape and the same frequency characteristics. There's code at the end of the loop to repeat the process with fewer data points, and then fewer data points again until we get down to 64 data points, and then it will restart the process. With fewer data points in each sample, it's more and more difficult to see the variation that's coming from the three different frequencies we put into the signal. It'll be really interesting to see what the FFT algorithm can pull out from this limited data. So we got down to 64 data points in that last tight little sample, and then the loop goes back to the start and continues over with 512 data points in the sample. Now we'll uncomment the FFT code and see what the results look like. In lines 47 to 51, we take the time, then call the Fourier transform and, uh, and the conversion to power spectral density from the other tabs. Then we take the time again, and that tells us how long it took. We do the same thing in lines 53 to 55, but this time we're going to call the integer base transform. Finally, we're going to print out some results so that we can see what the transform results look like in comparison to the signals. After the signal, we plot the FFT as a function of increasing frequency. The smooth red floating point trace is better behaved than the noisy green integer trace, but the floating point one took about 20 times as long to calculate. You can see two peaks really close together at 60 and 200 hertz. And then further along, there's another peak, not quite as tall, at 1200 hertz. 
The red and the green both do a good job of capturing those peaks. And it's important to remember that that's a logarithmic plot. So those peaks are extremely high compared to the regions around them. Now let's see what happens if we only have 256 points of resolution. We get the Fourier transform, and we can still see the peaks pretty clearly. They're both still there with the red and the green, so that's good. Lower still, down to now 128 points, and those peaks are still pretty clear, even though we can't see those characteristics in the signal. It's only when we get to about 64 points that we see that we start to lose definition on the peaks. Uh, particularly, we've lost the high frequency peak. So let's watch it again. If we've got a really strong signal with lots of points, then we can see the characteristics in the signal, and they come out very clearly in the FFT as well. But as we go down to having fewer points, we can't really see what's going on by looking at the signal, but we can still get really clear frequency information out of the FFT. And that continues as we go down to fewer and fewer points. The ability to do FFT calculations like this is just one of the reasons we might want to collect a whole array of points to process all together in our microcontroller. That's one of the reasons we'd like to have a bigger memory space in the microcontroller so that we can do these calculations and do them fairly quickly. It's important to note that even the relatively slow floating point calculation took place in small fractions of a second. You're welcome to dig into the code behind these fast Fourier transform functions, but most of us will want to just use them as a black box to get frequency information out of our signals.